My name is Doris Chen. I'm a, a technology evangelist at Microsoft. So uh, a lot of people ask me, you know, uh, what does a technology evangelist uh, would do? So I will talk about that in my next slide. But really, welcome to the uh, practical performance tips and trips, tricks talk. Uh, so uh, before I get started with uh, to share with you a little of my background, I'd like to get some ideas about your background. How many of you here? Uh, uh, I guess all of them, all of your web developers, right? Okay. Do we have any app developers? Okay, cool. Uh, okay, so uh, I would assume uh, you all have some background in JavaScript, HTML. Okay, very good. Uh, the reason I'm asking is uh, this is like if you're looking at, into the level of this talk, it's probably more like a 300 level kind of talk. So we're not really going over the uh, sort of like the fundamental uh, content, but more like uh, uh, move on to the advanced topics, right? Okay, so um, a, a common question people usually ask after a talk, they will say, uh, where are you gonna post your uh, presentation? And uh, uh, the link, the first link here is my blog link. Uh, I actually uh, have been speaking to HTML5 Dev Conference since the very first one. Uh, and I, I most likely after the uh, technical conference like this, I always post my uh, presentations, demo code, and sometimes even video uh, to my blog. Now, my blog address is a little long. If you don't remember that, that's okay, because I myself don't really remember it. Myself. So <laughs> most likely I'll just type the keyword MSDN, MSDN, like this, space, Doris, and usually the first, first link is my blog address. And you could always contact me through my Twitter, but notice there is a Doris T chain, there's a T there. So if you send to Doris Chen, I won't be able to uh, see your uh, uh, message. And as always, this is my email. Uh, you could always send me your uh, questions, feedback uh, regarding the talk, or you may be asking some other uh, Microsoft related technology. Uh, so um, I'm basically a web person. I uh, have been with Microsoft for about four years. Uh, so for all the four years, I'm focusing on the HTML5 JavaScript development, as well as how to develop the native uh, apps, modern apps, using those technology. And before that, I was a Java evangelist at Sun for about 10 years. Uh, so I'm working with open source Java community for, for more than 10 years. Um, and then performance talk is always one of my favorite subject because I remember uh, the first year I joined the Sun at a time, I started with doing Java performance. So that's at, at the time is really uh, a very you know, uh, uh, demanding and hot topic. Now I'm more switching onto the web performance. So we're gonna spend uh, quite a bit of time to talk about what is web performance, right? You may have different definition about what you really care about for the web performance. What are the things you should pay attention? What are the issues there, right? So we're gonna actually simply briefly go over that and uh, show you really briefly what are the tools you will be able to use. And then we're actually gonna actually uh, use uh, six principles to dive into that to see some of the real world problem and then I'll share with you some of the solutions we found useful for us. And through all the talk, uh, I will give quite a few demo uh, so that uh, you will see, you know, uh, you know, it's basically more like a benchmark kind of demo. It's, so you, you will see what's really going on. You see the solution we try to recommend or we try to suggest, does that make sense to you? So we'll do that. And uh, uh, it's a pretty inten intensive talk. So I would appreciate you could hold on to your question towards the last maybe five minutes. But I will be uh, staying here uh, quite a bit. Uh, we actually have an IE booth uh, downstairs. So I will be uh, staying in the IE booth if you have more questions. Oh, by the way, uh, have you get this cool t-shirt from IE booth? One of my favorite t-shirt. Go there, pick one. <laughs> Says, I have standards. It's really nice. Okay. All right, so um, before I start my talk, uh, I see most of you have some exposure to the web development, and some of you actually also are really doing the app development for different platforms, different stores. 
um, when we try to uh, illustrate here is focus on the website. However, all the trips, uh, uh, sorry, tips and the tricks and the best practice will be applying to a modern app. And then I use a Windows uh, 8 architecture as an example. So uh, the green area is regularly just a web application you've been developing using HTML, JavaScript, or some other scripting language and running in a browser, right? So this is really something we're doing every day. And then the, the blue area is actually the new area, which is how we could leverage in all the code, all the web code, and developing the native app which is called Modern Apps, could run on Windows 8 as well as on Windows Phone. Now, the reason we could actually share the same kind of code is the JavaScript engine in IE is called Chakra. The Chakra engine is the same on the desktop in the browser as well as on the uh, Windows uh, Modern Apps. So basically, all the code, if it's run successfully in IE 10 or above, you, know, you could actually run uh, as a Windows 8 app really easily. But the focus of this talk is not try to tell you how to convert and leverage your web content, but rather tell you all the best practice, all the solution we're applying on the website will be the same for the modern apps. And through the tops, I, I do want to address a few uh, uh, issues or, or particular uh, uh, parameters or impact, which is more uh, towards the modern devices like the smartphones, the tablets. Any questions on that? It's good. Okay, so, um, so let's actually start with what is a web performance. Um, so first of all, obviously, when you look into the very first time when the user click on initiate something on the browser, right? And then the first thing we do is you're sending a request over the network, right? So the network utilization is the first thing you probably want to look into. Now, Nowadays, uh, we look in, into the bandwidth because it's very important. So you all have a smartphone with you. But I don't know if you have the best data package. Usually, you have a limited data package, right? So your network bandwidth, in a way, might be limited by your uh, uh, data package. Or maybe you have a kind of relatively low-end kind of phone. So uh, maybe your network is just not fast enough and maybe you still have to face in the network latency. That's something you always have to face. In. And obviously you will say, okay, then seem like there are quite a few things it will impact this network utilization. Then what I would do as a developer? No, this is exactly something we wanna talk about, right? Not really, you know, the network latency is always there. We cannot change it, right? But how are we gonna live with it? How we could actually make uh, utilize, uh, uh, fully utilize the network uh, uh, and then make it faster. This is our job. So second I want to actually talk about, this is actually probably one of the most important uh, parameters to determine your uh, web performance. Now first, I'd like to actually start with a question. Um, a few years ago, when I'm giving the performance talk, I also asked the same question. I will give you the answer, uh, tell you the answer like uh, five years ago. How many, <laughs> what I should say, how long are you willing to wait when you click on something? You click on site, you click on link, and then you're, you're, you're willing to wait until that site, that screen, show you something. <laughs> milliseconds. 200 milliseconds. Okay, we get one answer. How about the rest of the crowd? Two minutes, you're extremely patient. Thank you for that. We probably don't have to stay here. We could all go home. Um, any other answer? Two seconds. Two seconds. Two seconds. Okay, so a few years ago, five years ago, I think the national average is about three seconds. And you're right. Right now, the bar is much higher. We're really looking to maybe within a second. Uh, even sometimes depends on if it's an app. We, we do look into real time, like a uh, uh, few hundred milliseconds. That's very reasonable, actually. <clears throat> so we talk about that. So if you're looking into your particular performance, your, your, your parameter is, say, second, even milliseconds. You know every bit counts, 
right? Milliseconds. Milliseconds is seriously, you have to use two to measure. You couldn't even see it with your eyes, right? So <clears throat> the reason I bring this issue here is there are multiple ways. There is a real kind of you know, performance, and there's another one we mentioned here. It's called a perceived performance. How many of you understand what's a perceived performance? OK, quite a lot of you. So basically, perceived performance is a, a classical example would be it's not exactly you know, uh, how, how fast the site is, but it's how well the user experience how well you feel that performance. For example, progress bar will be a classical example. Because usually, when you see a progress bar to download something, 0 to 99% is like a zoom. But it takes forever for that last 1% to download, isn't it? So why is that? That's, that's really a perceived performance issue. Because as a user, as an end user, you're downloading something. You think, I already wait until 99%. I cannot wait for the last 1%. Right? So it's a perceived performance, even though it does take a little longer to load, to download, but you're waiting to wait. The experience is still nice, right? You, you're okay. You see something responsive. So responsive, seeing something, that's actually very important. Because some of the uh, site, maybe some people ask a milliseconds, but you know, it maybe because of the backend issue, the database, whatever. The startup time, maybe it does take like uh, more than, say, two seconds. So what are you going to do? You have to actually do something to make your user happy. For example, somebody pop up some animation, some logo, or some puzzle, or something fun, so that uh, it will basically you know, catch people's attention, thinking that side is still working. So this is a perceived performance. But really, you know, no matter if it's a perceived performance or real kind of response, we, what we really look into is the CPU utilization. So this is a very typical kind of CPU utilization. You actually do see some kind of gap there, right? That is uh, probably some time uh, they need to download the content for JavaScript, HTML, or image. They're doing decoding on that. Or sometimes maybe you're making like this little dip here, maybe you're making a XHR kind of call, right? A synchronized call. So they have a little dip on the CPU uh, and, and so on. Now, so the most one of the most important parameters is obviously looking to the elapsed page load time. What is that? That is when I click a, a link, initially something, until the page is fully loaded. That is the time. So in this, this case, it's 1.8 seconds. Not bad, right? Not bad. Really, some people are waiting, two of you at least are waiting for two seconds, not to mention somebody wait, wait two minutes. That's more than enough. So one point, it's not bad. But Perhaps, more importantly, you don't want to just people, like I said, a perceived performance waiting there for 1.8 seconds without anything happen. The screen is totally blank, right? So the other thing, which is even more important, it's called time to grass. This is when the user initiates something and start to see something start to show up on the screen. This is what we call time to grass. And this particular app is about 0.65 seconds. So this is a very important parameter. So 0 0.65 is 650 milliseconds. Very good, right? However, if you look into the whole CPU time, you're looking at the real, real CPU occupying time is actually 1.39 seconds. And this is the thing we need to pay attention. Your CPU idle time, meaning it's not doing anything. You know, the little dip there, right? Doing the decoding, doing the processing, doing some download image. Idle time is 0.42 seconds, about 420 milliseconds. This is a parameter. If we do any performance tuning, this is something we need to pay attention. Our job is trying to reduce that CPU idle time to maximize, optimize our CPU time so that your app could run faster. Make sense? OK, so most of the talk here, we will actually focus on how we could actually uh, uh, by the measurement, how we could actually optimize the CPU time by uh, doing uh, various of principles. Now, the other thing I, I do want to actually mention about is the power consumption. Now, when you're doing the pure web application, a regular desktop or laptop, maybe you don't really pay that much attention. But what if you have a, a low-end phone? You're running the application, even a web application, in your browser. Right, your power consumption, power efficiency is actually very important. Right, 
uh, we usually, from that, we usually look at uh, three different things for the performance. We is called V-Sync. It's more like your visual uh, response, you know, how well you could keep up for the screen to have something display back. So screen is most likely the, the monitor runs 60 uh, hertz, so you will actually see all the response. And the other important thing is CPU utilization. We talked about that before in the previous slide. And one of the other thing is GPU utilization. This is also something we will be talking about, how, how we do the coding or how we do something will impact all those three things. Now, if your power is pretty efficient, you will see the response like this. But when your power is actually battery is low. So if you look at a CPU, right, CPU utilization directly relate to your battery life, your power consumption, basically, right? So if you're looking into all those things, if you say, my battery is really low, my, my, my device is getting really hot. Because of that, the device itself probably would say, you cannot start any new app, right? Basically, you're just stuck there because it's so hot. Uh, uh, battery is low. Uh, I don't think you have enough resource to start another app. And this definitely is not a good user experience, right? And not to mention, it would be very slow. If your battery is low, even though you're running a few apps or games there, you will see the slowness. All right, so power consumption is something we, we need to really take consideration, especially with modern apps running on the phones or tablets. So that uh, these are the three parameters uh, during the talk we will actually show you, you know, how we could uh, change that. Now, I'm gonna actually go over another important piece. You know, it's a little dry for you. It's called web runtime architecture. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, IE is using that, and so as so many other modern browsers are also using that. So let me sort of briefly go over that so you understand all your code, all your uh, uh, development, how does that sort of map into this. This is basically, uh, you could see how you initiate some action and then finally display onto the browser screen. So first, obviously, you, you go through the networking, you send a request, depends on the network, right? And then, it will actually parsing all your markup, your HTML, all those things. Next step is try to create a DOM tree, right? That DOM tree is at the same time is actually going to uh, parsing your CSS as well as parsing your JavaScript, right? And then uh, using some of the DOM API uh, capability to create uh, uh, your nodes, your elements into that tree. So this is where the DOM tree is. And this is obviously where your code matters. Where are you gonna put your style sheet? Where are you gonna put your JavaScript, right? This is the part it matters. Next step is formatting. Based on the markup, I could do uh, formatting into uh, internal representation. And then afterwards, based on the CSS, right? I could decide my layout because each piece of CSS is basically a box-based element. So each of that, you could actually apply in the, your internal layout. You could determine where exactly the position I should put into, where is the width and height, you know, and so on. And also you're gonna apply your Z index, for example, right? So, and then you actually dis create a display tree. This is actually very getting very close to finally push it onto the screen, but not quite yet. After you have that a visual display tree, then you actually go into the painting. Right, try to painting all the content. And then, finally, you push it into the composition. What does the composition do? Okay, this is actually where the GPU is going to be responsible. Most modern browsers will leave the composition stage, leave it to GPU to handle that. So that finally, afterwards, you're gonna see something display in your browser. So this is actually uh, uh, sort of like a, 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 a real architecture uh, most uh, browser will be implemented. And then it tries to give you some understanding why we have to look into all the architecture when you write code so you understand where I am, right? Okay, so I'm gonna share with you uh, some of the performance tools, right? So how many of you know, uh, i.e. there is a F12 free tools in the browser? Okay, so IE F12, I will give a very, very quick demo. IE F12 tools, it's just like you use any other modern browser, it could do a lot of things. Uh, uh, the JavaScript debugging, uh, the console, as well as I will show you, there's a, what we call CPU utilization or UI responsiveness. So you could see what's going on. 
And the other thing, which is also free on Windows, is called Windows Performance Toolkit. This is even more uh, uh, powerful than, than the F12 tool because it gives you all the thread, each simple thread, UI thread, or whatever, what's going on, the CPU utilization, the image download, and all the parameter you need to measure when you go into the performance tuning. So before I move into further, I'm actually going to um, take a look at one of the any website. And then if I hit F12, I will actually have a, a tool which is loading here. You could see all your DOM, Explorer, your manipulation. You could see the console. You could do the JavaScript debugging. Um, oops. Ha <laughs> 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 ha. OK. Yeah. Ah. Uh, I guess I can. Yeah, that's a little. Good. Is it better? Yeah. Well, you don't really need to see the browser. Uh, I, I'm trying to. Uh, you, you will see it later. I'm trying to show you is a tool running. So we talk about debugging. We talk about uh, you could use like uh, uh, the measure the network, like a HTTP request, response, and this is something, I think it's a, it's a new feature, and it's quite important. So for example, it's like a profile. I'm measuring the UI responsiveness, all right, in terms of CPU utilization. So take the profiling, I will reload the site. Once they reload, finish profile. And obviously, this particular one doesn't really have a lot of image, so you probably is not going to see much really going on. But the idea here is you will pay attention to those, because see, if we have a monitor that has 60 hertz, your frames per second, you're looking at a 60 frames per second. If this particular app is responsive like perfectly, then everything should be 60 frames per second. But in real life, you always see a little dip. So this particular measurement is for your visual output to see the frames per second. So you could actually take a look, the dip, and then uh, basically zoom it to see what's really going on. And that they will tell you, like for example, the green area is a starring, the CSS starring, the uh, purple here is a rendering, and then I sometimes could see the image loading and the scripting and GC. And then you could take a look at the detail, what's really going on. So this is actually a major tool for my performance test. So I could see if there is a, some big dip in the UI responsive here, then I, I, I want to find out what's going on, right? Obviously, you would never get exactly 60 frames per second for everything, but at least you don't have a major like a dip. That, that means your, your response uh, for app is actually pretty good. OK. so. I'm going to move on. This is just a, a very quick uh, uh, performance kind of demo for you to look into. So what I'm going to do mo more is I'm going to actually uh, share with you the six principles we actually use to do the performance tuning. And I'm going to go over uh, uh, each one of them in more detail and share with you uh, the uh, detail, the tips and tricks we learned. So first of all, the principle one is quick response to your network requests. Now. You all know network has a latency, your bandwidth may be limited by your carrier, so on. You cannot change the network, right? But what you could do is you could actually quickly respond to your network request. This is something you can do, isn't it? So how many of you here are using redirection? Redirect, anybody? Yeah. I would say avoid using redirection. This is probably going to hurt your performance. Uh, we do some measurements. It's easily will cost about 200, 300 milliseconds when you're doing redirection. So this is something you need to actually, you know, don't, don't just for the convenience. If you really, really have to redirect, of course, you don't have much choices. But if you don't have to redirect, don't do that. It's not a good thing for the performance. And then, as a matter of fact, you are not the only one. We took the, the, uh, the top 1,000 popular website. And uh, we, we actually do find that 63% uh, of websites, they do use redirect, which is really not something uh, we recommend for the performance. Because it, it could have really take 200, 300 milliseconds. That's quite a bit, right? That's at least 10, 20% uh, performance 
uh, hurt for overall, right? So the other thing is obviously use CDN. How many of you never use CDN? Okay, yes, some of you never use CDN. Okay, so even for, for those of you who use CDN, there's something I want to share with you. You probably want to take, take a look where your CDN is, where your server is. For example, this is try to picture something, say, from Seattle to Atlanta. So it's over like uh, uh, 2,500 miles, right, doing the round trip, right? So if you have a, such a, a big distance server, you actually kind of, you know, the, the sort of like a round trip of time, it's actually taking another 200 milliseconds. Do you know that? So you, you should actually take a look where your CDN is. CDN is a good technique to optimize it to make a performance faster. But then you should take a look at where the server is. So the recommendation would be if you can find some local server, local geo resource, like even cloud, right? Amazon, Windows Azure, uh, 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 Google uh, I.O., and all those leverage the cloud. You could actually put in your particular, say, JavaScript library, your particular toolkit into that. That would be much faster, right? So that's what we recommend. CDN, take a look. How, how, how far away your server is. That may cost some performance. Um, the other thing is you want to maximize your concurrent connections. So how many connections for a web application could have to a particular domain, do you know? Six, close enough, yeah. So normally for each domain, you could have up to six connections. Your, your app could make up to six connections for one domain. However, just like you have multiple hosts, right? You could have multiple domains. So that actually adding up all your network connection to a large amount of connection. Hence, don't worry about it. You think about uh, maybe, you know, you should just leverage more connections. That's the issue. Not like, oh, I don't have enough connections. You should leverage that. Because you could have multiple connections. So the next we want you to actually pay attention is reuse your connections, right? So in the HTTP response, right, you will see there is one called a connection cross. If you want to use that, don't close it. Leave it open, leave it there. You don't close it, you still could reuse your connection. So in that way, you're actually saving your CPU resource as well as you actually keep a multiple connection open, it will eventually optimize your performance, isn't it? Okay, so that's one tip we share with you, reuse the connections. Okay, so um, the other one is principle two, which is try to minimize your bytes download. So let's actually take a look at some statistics. This is actually from HTTP archive, all right? It's an independent source. And what we see here is they give you the average payload. So the average payload for any web application, according to the site, we will have 93 resources downloaded over 16 hosts. So this is an average, right? So 93 resources, that's quite a bit for any uh, web application, right? We look at that. And then that's, we do use multiple hosts. This is the average uh, payload. Now, if you look into different information here, what does that tell you? So you could see in this graphical colorful chart, the images, which is a blue area, are the dominant resources. Almost 55 pieces of resource are images. And then follow up with the other download piece is the yellow area, which is 17. This is a JavaScript. So we use those data as a guideline to see what other things we need to look into and then optimize. So we found two things, images and the JavaScript, right? Now, we also have some other data, which is uh, give you the average download size. So in this case, average uh, download size is 1.7 megabytes total. And then guess what? You would think with all the big images, all the resources we've downloaded, you would think most sites will be doing some caching. Well, unfortunately, there are only 46% of sites are doing caching. So the rest of them, more than 50%, more than 54%, the majority of the sites are not doing any caching. Do we see some problem there? So one thing is we should do more caching. That's another thing, right? And then if you look into this particular color chart, it's consistent with the uh, p particular problem we found. The, the red area, which are the images, and this is the dominant one. 
It takes like a, uh, almost like a, a one, one mega is all from the images. And then follow up with, uh, we have the green area, which is a JavaScript, right, and so on. So it's both from the resource download as well as the total size download, we feel image and the JavaScript are the two things we need to look into because they are uh, probably contribute to the most of the payload. So based on that, we actually have our strategies and the solutions. So one important thing to look into, how many of you heard about gzip, right? We all know gzip, so I'm not gonna spend time. Basically, by default, you have gzip. You just have to use them, right? Make sure you don't turn it off. Use them, right? It could really compress your network traffic. Use them by all means. The other things uh, you could look into is, um, say you, you need to have some static resource. Your, your startup sort of resource, images and all those things, sound or maybe videos or the media, right? So what you're looking to is, especially when you develop a modern apps, you, what you want to do is probably not directly every time getting it from the server, from somewhere else. You should actually package it locally. For any of the apps, either it's Windows uh, or iOS or Android, you should, you, you, more likely, you will package all those things, your web content, your web media together as a startup, because that's actually going to give you the best performance. So if you have modern apps, you definitely should do a local package. And then, what do you say is, what if, you know, I have some dynamic content, right? I could, it's not static. I could not package it as a startup. I won't be able to do that. Then what you could do is using the HTML5 app cache. How many of you actually heard about it? app cache? Are you using them? Okay, so this is actually, app cache would be a very good way to uh, both store your static data as well as your dynamic data. So for those of you who may not know the detail, the app cache is basically when you have internet, the app cache mechanism will connect to the, to the server and try to get all the data you wanted to save, either images, videos, like JavaScript library or some style sheet, right? And then it's on its own. So for example, some of the, say, kids game, right? You, you go to a particular place, a restaurant or some, some, some outside, they don't have internet. So your kids will say, ah, I could not play this game anymore, right? So you probably could use app cache to save all those things locally. So even though here you don't have any internet. You don't need to get any content from a server. In this case, you could leverage all the local library, local image, video, you know, to do something. Now, what's cool about that is later on, when internet is available, then app cache will automatically determine if there's any change in terms of all the resources you already saved. If there's a vision two, V2, right? Then it would say, ah, okay, let me get in the new image, new video, new sound, new JavaScript library, new style sheet, because there's some change on the server. So it will actually push it back again. Now, so, and it's extremely easy to implement. What you do is basically, it's a manifest-based caching mechanism. So what you do is you will create a manifest file just like this, and then you will put it into your HTML uh, level, you say manifest equal to this app, app cache manifest file. And then depends on what you want to do. You could define it uh, from the cache. I want to get a logo. I want to get a video. I want to get a, maybe a, a, a sort of network. I want to get in a new version of MP4. Or maybe I want to do some fallback. For example, maybe there is some uh, 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 failure uh, case because of network or whatever, and I want to have something. And at the same time, you could also save the style sheet, save the library that way. Right, so pretty cool, and it's very easy to do. And you could, uh, you could always configure your uh, manifest anytime. Right, it's configurable. It's not a part of the code. Right, so as long as you register into HTML, you're good. So this is how you could use App Cache, and we use it a lot, especially like I have a game developer for kids. I have to consider with internet or without internet. This would be a good place to use App Cache. Okay, the other thing uh, we, we should actually pay attention is in the request response level, uh, we should be uh, providing some cacheable content. So for example, uh, for in this particular case, there's quite a bit of uh, image content for my front page, and I probably, they, they won't expire. 
they're good, good for a while. So I don't want to actually uh, getting it all the time, right? So I could actually uh, put an expiration date so we could cache them. So this is a way you could actually uh, cache all data. You could do it such a way, or you could also do a conditional cache. You could actually put a conditional, say, uh, if particular things did not change, then this, those data would be good, good up to a certain time. You could also do both ways. So you could configure that very easily on uh, your know, HTTP level. Now, perhaps you say, OK, what if not from the HTTP, right? What if I have some code, right? See, I use jQuery a lot. What are the uh, good way to actually cache it? So one way to look into that is you could actually have a cached jQuery data request. Do you know that? So the way to do that is very simple. jQuery is just so simple. Everybody love it. When you make an AJAX call, you could just turn this cache into true. And that's it. And then that way, you could actually keep in your cache in your code. So you, you basically, you implement your cache depends on what you want. In this case, is caching all the uh, particular uh, uh, AJAX call, right? This is how you do it. And obviously, this is uh, sort of one way. There are so many other ways you will be able to control how you want to cache it. And we could talk about, talk about that a little bit later. OK, so one common mistake, I think I hope no one you guys uh, already made, but I do see this a lot, is um, you know, sometimes we, we, we don't really care uh, if it's a, a lowercase or uppercase, right? So if we do something called icon.png, right, we could do a absolutely all lowercase. We could do a little like a first letter, uh, capital letter, right, first, first letter. And if somehow uh, it's carries, I just do an IC capital letter. Now when you do this, for the server, every time you're sending that, it's a new request. The, even though the server knows, ah, you, you mean the same icon. It's not the same image I'm going to send back to you. But from what I see from request, this is a new request. So I have to give you a new image to download. So anybody did this? So if you do that, you're wasting your resource. Because this, this will trade a totally new image. All right, so be careful, pay attention to that. And we see a lot of people actually doing it without really pay attention. Okay. All right, so we just briefly went through the first two principles. One is response quickly to your network request. The second one is looking at your download bytes. Think about the caching, right? Third principle, how do you optimize your media usage? In this case, we will focus on images. Because like we said, from the statistics, from the average payload, we see there are so many, like 93 resources, 53 of the, 55 of them are actually images. So we, we know we need to work with images. So this is another piece of statistics we took from the top most popular 100,000 websites. And then when we look at that, the average media resource we get is 58. Right? So that's another piece of data to show you, you know, how important you, you should work with your images. So let's start with uh, a very simple thing when we try to uh, get in that image and what we call the native image resolution. Okay, so for example, nowadays I develop an app. I want to support a different screen size, right? Big screen laptop, a, a smaller tablet, a phone like this, right? And probably you could use Median Query to, to change your layout, to apply different CSS rules to make it more presentable for your particular device. Now, one common mistake people may make is the particular image is actually from the server. And that particular image is a large scale with very good resolution kind of image. And when you use all the Median Query to actually fit into different screen, you may have different size for your image. But however, at the same time, you're still requesting this large size image, right? So in this case, the original logo size is 500 by 400. This is original. And then you say, ah, for me, I only need a 50 by 40, right? So what happens is that big image is going to be downloaded from the server. And then it's going to be doing decoding, it's going to be processing, and then it's going to actually shrink it into 50 by 40. So all those things, all those operation takes time, isn't it? Right? So when you do all those, try to support uh, the, the image, try to use the, 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 find the good size for your particular application. 
meaning you may have to prepare multiple size of image. Like in this case, I would just have a 40, uh, 50 by 40 smaller image on the server. So when I get it, I could directly use it. I don't have to resizing, I don't have to do all the large decoding processing. Make sense? All right, so I'm gonna show you something in the demo to see how much it's gonna impact the performance, all right? So this is one of the tip I wanna share with you. Uh, try to use the right size. Do not just take the convenience, take a huge image, and then try to uh, uh, use it in different, different apps. The other thing is you probably heard about that, right? Nowadays we actually have a little those a bunch of images, right? A list of images for the podcast, or maybe I'm doing the social media. I'll have all the Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, all, all those icons there, right? So um, maybe you have like 1,000 images you have to you have to get from a server. So how do you do it? Do you do one at a time? Very good. Exactly. Most people know use sprites. Anybody never heard about the usage of sprites? Few of it. Okay, so obviously, if you look at that, right, if I'm using uh, just one image at a time, I have uh, six images, then basically I have to make six connections, six requests, any, right? Ask, download six different images separately doing decoding, all those things. So as a total, I would generate 96K as a download. Right. Whereas if you put six images in such a nice format and then download it and display it directly, then you only make it's one image, one connection, one HTTP call, and you only get you only need a 21k download in this case. So it's a, it's a huge saving from 96 to uh, 21 is almost like a four or five times smaller than before. And then also when you do the sprite image. Uh, this is another tip. Uh, I know some of you use a sprite editor tool, but sometimes you may want to do it manually, use your graphic tool. Because what I see is sometimes they, because of the nature of the image, when they try, try to put a sprite, they leave a lot of space in the middle of that a sprite image. And then you're wasting a lot of uh, room for that. So if you can, do it manually, right? Okay, sprite image versus that. Ha, huh. this is another classical kind of, uh, 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 debate. What image should I use? PNG or JPEG? Any preference here? PNG is the winner? Is that right? Yeah. Looks like it. In this room, everybody loves PNG. Okay, so let's take a look at a little detail. So, PNG obviously is a little default one, right? And uh, it's good for logos, charts, graphs, uh, screenshots, right? Those, those are the usage for PNG. Now, for JPEG, if you have a lot of photographs, right? You have uh, landscapes, you have some faces, you have, have really good resolution. So more likely use JPEG. And obviously, you know, there are some other image type you could use, but I would say probably most likely people use either JPEG or PNG. Now, let's take a look. Um, before I get into, you know, what we found, I want to actually share with you uh, something that uh, maybe could be confusing for you. So how many of you think download size and the memory size are the same thing? I guess I show you the content already. So basically download size, memory size, they're not the same, okay? So for example, I could have an image with a dimension 683, 1024, uh, the disk size, the image size is actually uh, 557 kilobytes. I could have an image like this. But the, the Im, the, this image memory size is not equal to 557. It's actually equal to the width and height times that times four. So as a result, the image size here is 2.67 megabytes need to be decoded. So if you look at that, all the image size, even though it's a relatively small image, you look at a 557 kilobytes and no big deal, right, 500. But if you think about it, their memory size is actually two mega something. And you're adding, if you say you have 55 images like, like that size, it's a lot of memory size. You have to, you have to do a decoding and have to allocate. That's quite a lot to work with, right? So based on that, I want you to share with you some of the image downloading kind of like a mechanism. Okay, so normally you have a request, say I want to get an image, and it's pretty smart, it could do a partial sort of response and receive a, a sort of like a screen, the, the image partially, they kind of do the processing and it started doing decoding. 
and then getting more image and doing still partial uh, response received, doing more decoding. Afterwards, takes a little more time to finish your decoding, and then you also have some time to processing that image downloading. And then, this is another step. For most of the modern browsers, we're using GPU. Remember, we use GPU to do the composing on our web runtime architecture, right? So this is a time we need to actually copy those image content into the GPU, and it's gonna take time, right? And then finally, when GPU get it, it could display that image. So this is basically how we do for the uh, download uh, uh, image and to display. Now, when we look at uh, the, a few things uh, for the downloads and the CPU usage, this is go back to what, what we look at as three things, CPU utilization, GPU, and the visual response, right? So we look at that. The CPU usage here is in this area, the, all the green one here, because see, JavaScript, no matter what, is a single thread. It's a UI thread kind of uh, application. So you will see basically UI thread before, and after uh, getting everything done with decoding, you will have the sort of like a decoding is taking place for most of the part. And then you will see the GPU usage. So the GPU is not really sort of like uh, start to happen, right? Until it finishes decoding, finish processing, and then start to copy everything into GPU. Then the GPU is start to really participate into this downloading game. So this is where the GPU is. Now, but what you see here is there is time you need to copy into the GPU. And this is, could be, depends on the implementation. Could be uh, very long, could be uh, actually uh, considerably impact your performance. And this is basically, uh, for most of the modern browsers, this is uh, what they do when you have an image download. Now, what I want to take a look is the JPEG, all right? So before IE 11, uh, including Windows 8, IE 10, everything is actually like the diagram I showed you in the previous slide. This is how we handle the JPEG. Now, with IE 11, which is on Windows 8.1, this is the version I'm running here, is we actually did a quite a bit of optimization to support the JPEG, to support the JPEG download and decoding. So if you look at a diagram, the concept is still the same. However, the time we're doing the decoding and the processing are shorter. And then especially we reduce the time to do the CPU, the GPU copy. So this is a pretty uh, a big sort of improvement. So as a result, we actually could improve the CPU utilization by 40%, but memory utilization by the 30%. So to answer your question, if you're using the IE 11 or using some new modern browsers, I would say JPEG is actually better because in general, JPEG, the size of JPEG will be always a little smaller than PNG because JPEG is, is lossy, the other is lossless, right? So the size will be smaller, and because the browser, all the modern browser try to optimize all the GPU copy, all the, all the uh, uh, decoding time. So uh, in general, if you use new browser IE 11, JPEG will actually will be a good of choice. So that's a little surprise or to you know, most of you learn. In the, and it is absolutely true. Two years ago when I did this talk, I did say use PNG. Now, because all the new browser is improving all the uh, handling different image, so JPEG seems to be is getting better. So I will try uh, the, the JPEG. So let me actually give you a, a quick demo. So first of all, we learned quite a bit of things in this uh, session, right? We learned we need to get in the right size for your image. So we did some little benchmark kind of test, right? So what we do here is we have a large image uh, scale down, basically use the right uh, large image and the letter you know, become a very small. So this is, a so the internet is very slow, obviously. Uh, it does take a lot of time to, to load in the image. But I want you to pay attention is I actually purposely uh, uh, actually having a little like a uh, laptop logo, which is saving it here and it's still not showing up. And this is particular one is I started with a full size uh, image and then the downsizing into such a small image. And then I'm hoping with <laughs> the slow internet, it's, it's going uh, to eventually show, all right? And then in that process, at least you know, what I do is I have to you know, uh, get in the, uh, that image, 
big image download. I have to do decoding. I have to work with a large memory. And then finally, it's there. <laughs> and then I have to do resizing, right? So this is with the large image. And let's actually, I don't know if this demo will run very good. This is actually, I choose the exact size for that image. OK, now we see it immediately. So this is the difference. Obviously, everybody's network is different. So uh, your result might be different. But what you see is this, I wait for so long. I have to keep on talking right, for so long until you see this image pop up. And then whereas this approach is I just getting an image with this laptop size, right, this image size, and then just download. And then let's take a look at the result. And like I said, everybody's mileage will be different. This is the data we got. Our server is actually running in Seattle. Um, so what you see here is uh, the, from the data we have, at least all the data will give you a good indication. Even though you test all those things in your environment. For example, you could test exactly the same benchmark in different browser. You may get a different result. But I think in general, the trend, the indication, the direction will be the same. So if I have, I have to really scale my large image, the time it takes to download is 1.8 seconds. Versus if I actually keep that image in the right size and then display that, I am only take 600 milliseconds. So it's almost three times shorter than you have to scale that large image. So that's actually a pretty good improvement. If you're looking into, we're really saving about 1.2 seconds here. That's quite a crucial, right? OK, so let's actually take a quick look of our second demo. This is the one I use is basically measured performance for downloading all the individual uh, uh, you know, uh, images and then versus uh, you know, use a, a sprite and to download minify and combine. So what you actually see here is I actually did it on purpose. This particular image, even though you see is one image, it's actually a list of large images. So there's about, I don't know, 10 or 20 images there. So what I do is I actually sprite all those large images and then try to uh, display here. So what you see is, obviously, you save the total size of the image download, but then you do see a little performance uh, slowness. That's actually give you a hint is if you have a large image with good res resolution like this, perhaps you have to think about how you, gotta, how you, you want to do the sprites. Small image logos, it's very good, but with a large image like that, uh, you may not want to do that. Oops. So I think I well, I'll show you some result. Okay, so the performance gain here is with the individual one is 210 milliseconds. With all the uh, combined sprites one is uh, 164 seconds. So we get about uh, 20, 30 percent again, which is not bad, right? So uh, looks like I need to speed up. I actually <laughs> didn't know time uh, fry so much. Uh, so I actually going to uh, probably not finish the whole presentation, but uh, as I said, it will always post it on the on the site. So the other thing I want to show you is always remember, you know, keep your style sheet on the top, right? You always know that from Steve Sato's book. Never keep your style sheet in the bottom. That's another thing, right? And then. Um, also, include all the necessary styles. If you have uh, some style, you, you only need it for, you only keep the style for that page. You don't do a global style so that you have multiple page. This style sheet is applied for multiple page, but you never put it into your startup page because that's gonna slow down your performance. So that's another tip with regarding, you know, uh, getting the necessary style. And then always, always link the JavaScript at end of the file. You all know that, right? Okay, so this is very important. Um, and also, avoid trying to put a JavaScript in the header in an inline way. That's actually a very bad thing, right? Um, okay, so I'm gonna actually uh, speak, uh, okay, one thing I wanna mention. Do check your duplicate library. So your project maybe have multiple JavaScript or multiple HTML. Sometimes at a different level, you may include jQuery again and again. Every time you include a copy of jQuery, it's gonna cost you. So this is a very common mistake. 52% of the page is having this problem. So you need to actually keep in mind, right? And then also try to standardize with one framework. You don't need all the framework. Don't use all the framework just because they are cool. 
you have to ask yourself if you absolutely need those frameworks. This is another thing I see a lot of people, a lot of developers, a lot of websites has this issue, because they say, ah, that's really cool. And also, try to use all the CSS3 feature instead of writing your own JavaScript, like CSS gradient, board radius, transform, animations. OK, so I'm going to stop here, do a quick demo, and uh, that's it. Uh, so one uh, benchmark I want to show you here is First, we did an experiment with putting a style JavaScript in the header versus in the bottom. The re result is showing you it's huge. So if you leave in the header versus in the bottom, you're actually getting six times slower. Right? So that's quite a dramatic. And uh, um, if you do multiple frames, like a, a lot of libraries putting versus a single source, you're actually getting 20 times faster. So if you're putting a bunch of libraries there versus you're only putting a few you need, it's 20 times faster. Um, another thing is, this is uh, basically the uh, one is used JavaScript, one is used CSS animation. The result is also uh, very big. What you see here is, you will see the GPU. If you use CSS, you won't actually use any of the IE related uh, GPU at all. So this is used CSS, this is used JavaScript. With the GPU, with the JavaScript, you do use G, uh, some of the IE GPU, but with the CSS3, you don't need any IE-related GPU. So it always save a lot of resources. OK, so I think my talk is a little bit too long. Uh, I will actually keep it uh, there. And uh, I'm running out of time for, uh, for the question. But I will actually uh, go back to the six principles, uh, what we try to do. So here, I want you to remember to take away. One is response quickly to your network requests, right? Minimize all the image download as much as you can. Op optimize the way you work with images, finding the right native size, uh, try to do sprites, try to look into is a PNG, JPEG makes sense, and also look into the markup, like uh, where you put your JavaScript, right? If you use CSS versus JavaScript, and uh, some other things I don't have time to go over, but basically we just talk about how to write some of the tips to write uh, faster JavaScript. And uh, this is a resource page. This is all the performance tuning. You should get uh, most of the content. This presentation is actually use a lot of uh, information there, including Steve Sato's books and some other Java performance uh, uh, talk. With that, thank you very much.